What's going on, YouTube fan? It's your boy Tony Two Times, and we back with another video, man. And in this video, I'm gonna take y'all through a walk with me through my journey through prison as a teenager. You know, before I start this video, let me put a little disclaimer. I'm not glorifying this. I'm telling y'all this. I'm telling the youth this so they won't make these same mistakes that I made. So if you've been following me for a minute, I'm pretty sure y'all know I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. You feel me? At 17 years old, I got locked up for a charge. You know, I ain't gonna speak too much on it. You know what I mean? And it was serious, and they charged me as an adult. So basically, when I got locked up, first time being locked up, other than little petty stuff, my daughter was three months, my mother had just passed away. I was running wild, playing with guns, doing all that. Everything I speak on when I do my little celebrity videos, I'm speaking from a place of understanding or from a place that I've been through a lot of them things that y'all hear me talk about. So basically, when I was 17, when I went in there, you know, I had to fight, of course. Like Baltimore, you know, it's just like that. When you go in jail, they gonna try you. So I was fighting, you know. So as soon as I went in there, I was on a juvenile tier. Even though it was a big boy like jail, they got a juvenile tier for people that's under 18. But if you fight on the juvenile tier, they send you to the adult tier. So like my first week, I got in a fight. So I went on lockup, you feel me? 23 hours a day, one hour out, 17 years old, going crazy, trying to read every book. You know, when I got out lockup, they sent me to the adult tier. They used to call me juvie, like juvenile, because I was so young. But you know, I fought my case basically for like eight months, you know. I had a lawyer, I thought I was gonna beat it, or I thought I was gonna get like two, three years. But when I went to court, they gave me 20 years, all suspended, but five, you know. That's why I be telling y'all little dudes, you out there breaking law, make sure you know the law, bro, because when you get in that courtroom, you gonna pass out if they say 20 years. At the time, I ain't know what that meant. I thought they gave me 20 years until my uncle and people around me that been through the system, like, nah, what that mean, you got five years, but when you come home, you got five years parole and probation. And if you violate, they'll give you that 15. So I had to do the five. I went to MCTC, that's Maryland Correctional Training Center in Hagerstown, Maryland. They call it the young jail. You feel me? There's a lot of young dudes up there. There's a lot of old heads up there too. But basically, it's gladiator school, you know? You got to be about that. You know what I mean? You got to stand on your own too. I mean, a lot of my family was up there, so it helped me. But I had some old heads that took me under their wing. For like my first year, I was running wild. You know, I was taking stuff. I was fighting. I stayed on lockup. But after that, I had some old heads talking to me because I thought there wasn't no hope. I thought my life was over with. I'm like, I got a felony now. I might as well be in the streets forever. But they was like, man, shorty, you young. You going to go home. You going to be like 21. You can get you a girl, get married, take care of your kids, get you a little job, clean your credit up. And plus, you know, like I had dudes that... I knew that I looked up to from my neighborhood that was in there and they had got their life together, turned their life over to God. So I knew it was possible. So, you know, I got my diploma. I started taking things seriously. I got my diploma. Like it took me like four months to get my diploma. Like you had dudes in there like, man, I ain't getting no diploma because when I go home, I'm going to do the same thing. But I knew without that diploma, I couldn't do nothing for my daughter when I came home. Like my daughter was three months when I got locked up. You know what I mean? So, you know, I went through my little phases, you know. I went through all the little wilding out stuff, but I started taking it seriously. Once I got my diploma, they put me on something called a MAP program. A MAP program is where, though, as long as you do right, you pretty much slide through the system. You go from a regular jail to pre-release. Where pre-release is, it's kind of like getting you ready to go home. So I went to pre-release on the hill in Hagerstown, Maryland, where though I went out to work every day. I had my diploma. Then from there, they sent me to BCCC. Baltimore City Correctional Center. I went down there, you know. I um I did road crew. That's when you go out, you see the people on the road picking up trash. Then I went to work release. Went to work release, got a job, and you know I came home on the box and I stayed at that job six years. I'm running through this, but it wasn't that fast. It's like three and a half years. But yeah, man, that was my journey, you know. And I tell all y'all young dudes, man, please don't go out here and get a felony, man. I'm 32 years old. I still deal with this. You feel me? And, you know, I just wanted to update y'all on this, man. I just felt like talking about this today. If you're new to the fan, be sure to subscribe. Hit the notification bell for uploads. Check out the links in the description. Follow me on Instagram at underscore Tony two times. Love y'all, fam.
What's going on, YouTube fam? It's your boy Tony two times, and we back with another episode of the Baltimore Way, man. Before I start, be sure to tap that like button. Definitely watch this video to the end to hear the full story and all the details in the case. For the day one fam, y'all already know it's all love. Thanks for tuning back into another episode. If you're new to the channel and you're feeling the content, feel free to subscribe. Definitely hit that notification bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new video. Oh yeah, feel free to share the channel with your peoples. Everybody is welcome. Let's get right into the story. One thing I know we can all agree on is that money talks. That little green piece of paper can turn the most humblest person to being flashy, flexing, and showing off. When it comes to material things, we all know that cash will get you everything you want. As long as you got it, you can spend it willingly. But with us men, we figured out a long time ago that dollar bill also attracts women. You have dudes that will pull out their whole paycheck in the store if it's decent looking females around just to show they got it. Just like a form of bait. We see it all the time from a woman choosing a man because of the type of car he drives, where he lives, his profession, or just because he has a bag, which is understandable. Some women feel like they should be taken care of. Old heads used to say, the struggle attracts the woman you need. The one you know who is solid because she stayed down when you had nothing. But money attracts the woman you want. The crazy part is, if you know how to carry yourself a certain kind of way, got a few dollars, charisma, it might even attract another man's woman. Most of us know the game. If you can get her, then you can have her, my boy. Especially if she is chasing an image. But some men can't stomach the fact they thought they had something solid until a slicker dude with more money comes around and your girl is choosing. And a hurt ego can make most men crash out real fast. And on this episode of The Baltimore Way, we'll be discussing a case of a man who drove out of town just to crash out after realizing his wife was smashing the plug. All the way back in 2011, a 41-year-old man named Nathan Bowles was navigating the streets of Baltimore and living his life. Nathan was doing all right for himself and had a nice apartment out Middle River in Baltimore County. He was making a few dollars, but see, Nathan's way of making money wasn't legit. He would go to New York with a few stacks, find out who had the cheap prices on the gas, and bring pounds back to Baltimore to flip. Well, he gave some of the packs to his runners or sold weight. The operation was going smooth. On one of his trips up top, he ran across a woman who we'll call Maya for the sake of this story. Maya seemed to be into Nathan. She liked his accent, the way he was moving, and the two would start linking up from time to time, having some adult fun. But whole time, Maya was married to a 42-year-old Brooklyn man named Quincy Jackson. Quincy wasn't a slouch. He tried to provide the best way he could, but it seemed his wife was seeking something different. Quincy soon became convinced Maya was dealing with another man. He decided to do his homework, watching his wife's patterns, what she was wearing, leaving the house, checking her phone and text messages. Until finally, he realized she was having an affair with a man from Baltimore who often came in town. Quincy confronted his wife before calling Nathan, telling him, yo, bro, I'm going to kill you if you don't stop sleeping with my wife. In typical Baltimore fashion, Nathan told the man, like, yo, you geeking. You got to talk to Shorty about that. Quincy would start writing in a journal about his marriage. and one of his entries, Quincy wrote, My wife is smashing another man. No more venting on paper. The world will feel my pain. I'm going to take a life. On January 7th, 2011, Quincy rented a car and drove from Brooklyn to Maryland after finding out where Nathan lived. He parked outside the apartment complex in Middle River and waited. Knowing how Nathan looked, Quincy sat lurking. Not long after... Nathan walked out the building to piss something in the car before walking back up to the building. That's when 14 shots went off, striking a man multiple times. As neighbors heard the shots, they called Baltimore County Police, who responded to the location to find Nathan laying in the hallway of his building, suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. He was rushed to a local hospital, but unfortunately, he wouldn't survive his injuries. Back on the scene, police found shell casings and a gun. They felt like that was the murder weapon but they had no information on the shooting. 
until a man approached them and requested an interview stating he knew about the situation. The man who we would call Joe sat down with the detectives and stated he worked for Nathan as a runner. He claimed Nathan would drive to New York to get product, then he would give him a few pounds to get off. He told them he felt the New York dude shot his homie, but he didn't know why. He only knew a man from Brooklyn had threatened to take Nathan's life. After the interview, the next day, the detectives received a tip from an anonymous caller who claimed to have information on the shooting. They claimed Nathan was a drug dealer, but also that he was sleeping with a man named Quincy's wife. He also told police that Quincy lived in Brooklyn, New York. Police felt like the whole situation could be drug related and they kind of brushed it off. As Joe also told them, Nathan was planning a big run in New York in a few days because he had rented a car for him. Police got a warrant for Nathan's house to look for evidence. Inside was a scale, a few ounces of grass, a gun, but nothing major. But a search of the rental car parked outside that police had got word Nathan was loading up before he was shot, had a duffel bag in it with $90,000 in cash. The money was all stacked up and $1,000 stacks, ready for his trip. This led police to feel it wasn't a robbery or drug related at all. And maybe that the tipster was right about Nathan's affair with a married woman. The money was seized, considered to be drug money. And Baltimore County Police headed to Brooklyn to locate Quincy. They had information on the address for the man. They sent NYPD to search the apartment. Inside, they found the journal where he wrote about his wife's affair, bullets that matched the same caliber on the scene, and a rental car receipt. The detectives tracked Quincy's phone location the day before Nathan was hit and a few days later. It showed him rent the car, drive from New York, the whole route until he reached Baltimore County. Then not too long after Nathan was shot, take the trip right back with that same route. Quincy was taken into custody, charged with first degree hit and use of a firearm and the commission of a felony. As the case made his way to trial, prosecutors painted Quincy as a jealous man who was mad his wife was sleeping with a drug dealer from out of town. Quincy's lawyer tried to fight for the man, but with the enterprise car receipts, a journal, the gun left on the scene, and phone records, Quincy was cooked, found guilty on all charges, sentenced to life, all suspended for 40 years in prison. Nathan's family tried to fight to get the money back that was seized from the car, but the feds capped it and stated it was money from drug trafficking. Rest in peace to Nathan. I send my prayers and condolences to his family. In my humble opinion, Quincy went out bad. He was so hurt, even if he did decide to take Nathan's life for sleeping with his wife, he didn't even attempt to do it the smart way to cover his tracks or nothing. He left the gun, kept his journal, rented a car, and told somebody what he was about to do. I know most men have fell in love with a woman they thought was that, but ended up being this. It's a cold game, and I know it hits harder if it's your wife. Through the pain though, you gotta stay logical. If she will creep off with another man this quick, is she even worth your freedom? Fellas, keep it a buck. Have you ever lost a female you cared about or loved to another man or been fooled thinking she was somebody she wasn't? Let me know in the comments. Yeah, man, crazy story. Rest in peace that man. I definitely send my prayers to his family. But I ain't gonna talk too much more about this one. Y'all leave it in the comments. I appreciate you if you made it to the end. This is another episode of The Baltimore Way. This your boy Tony two times. Love, fam. I'm out. Hey, girl, Mrs. Tony two times. And I'm back with another episode of The Baltimore Way. In this video, we'll discuss the 2013 slaying of 32-year-old Latricia Gowdy Sowers L. But before we get into this video, please hit the like button and make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any future uploads. And of course, feel free to share this video with everyone you know. Also, if you'd like to see more episodes in the Baltimore Way series, please click the link to the playlist in the description box after this video to get caught up. All right? Let's get right into it. One of life's most ultimate feelings of betrayal is when a friend ends up dating your ex or a former spouse. You question everything. Were they already messing around? When did they start having feelings for each other? Was everything all a lie? 
Did my friend only come around to get close to my ex? How could they do this? Some questions may be answered, some may not. Now what do you do? Do you cut ties and say good riddance to the both of them? Or do you stay cordial and on speaking terms? What if children are involved and now your friend can become the step-parent? What is it like having to deal with the hurt and betrayal from the two people you thought you could trust? Let me know in the comments below as I tell the tragic story of how one woman lost her life after her best friend started dating her estranged husband and father of her child. Latricia Gowdy was born in Sandusky, Ohio in May 1981. Latricia graduated from Sandusky High School and relocated to Baltimore where she attended the Baltimore School of Massage to become a massage therapist. Latricia had a passion for doing hair and was an avid hairstylist. Latricia was described as a caring, loving, and given person who treated everyone like family. And family was very important to her. Latricia met and married her husband, who I'll call Mo, and they had one son together. Not only did Latricia enjoy spending time with family, but she was also a part of the praise and worship team at her church. Latricia's faith in God played a big role in her life. By the time their son was three years old, 32-year-old Latricia and her husband were separated. Despite their marital issues, the couple split time with their son. As if the separation wasn't difficult enough for Latricia, she also had to deal with the fact that her best friend, 30-year-old Gabrielle Smith, was now dating her estranged husband. Gabrielle was most likely one of the persons Latricia had confided in about her marriage. I mean, they were best friends, so I would imagine that she did. As a result of Gabrielle's betrayal, she and Latricia were no longer friends. On the afternoon of Monday, October 20th, 2013, Latricia headed over to Mo's apartment to pick up their son. It was almost dusk by the time Latricia arrived at the apartment on Fairview Avenue in Northwest Baltimore. As Latricia approached Mo's unit, she saw her former best friend, Gabrielle, sitting on the stoop outside the apartment. Latricia was visibly upset and the two women started to argue. Mo stepped in between them and was holding Latricia back. A neighbor named Miss Palmer heard the voice of Latricia coming from outside of her apartment. Miss Palmer went downstairs to the stoop outside of her apartment to get a better look. She saw Gabrielle standing on the stoop outside of Mo's apartment and saw Mo holding Latricia back, preventing her from coming towards Gabrielle. Miss Palmer heard Latricia telling Gabrielle, it's not right that you're messing with my husband. I thought we were good friends. Miss Palmer said Gabrielle responded to Latricia to get over it. He don't want you. Miss Palmer also noticed that Gabrielle was holding a knife in her right hand. She heard Gabrielle angrily make the statement, I'll be going to jail tonight. Latricia eventually found her way to an area next to the stoop where Gabrielle was standing. Latricia, still upset and emotional, was telling Gabrielle to come down and reached out for something from the grill that was nearby, but there was nothing there to grab. At some point during the altercation, Latricia grabbed a nearby beer bottle and threw it against the wall, shattering it out of anger. According to Gabrielle, Latricia was waving the bottle around in a threatening way before she threw it. Men who were nearby also tried to keep the women apart. 
Mo was able to calm things down between the two women momentarily as he went inside his apartment to get his son ready to leave. He thought maybe if he got his son, Latricia would be on her way. However, Latricia and Gabrielle were still going back and forth even though they were separated. Mo stepped back out of his apartment and Latricia ran from where she was standing and into the parking lot while Gabrielle stayed on the stoop. Mo headed toward the parking lot. Then he and Latricia began to argue. Mo then placed both his hands on Latricia's shoulder. Gabrielle ran off the stoop towards the parking lot and stopped near Mo's right side. Just a couple moments later, Latricia dropped to the ground. She had been cut and slashed. Gabrielle ran inside Mo's apartment and then back outside a few minutes later. Miss Palmer walked over to where Latricia was laying in the parking lot and asked Gabrielle had she cut Latricia. Gabrielle responded no. When Miss Palmer asked Mo what happened, he said he didn't know. Miss Palmer said she heard Gabrielle make a comment about how she thought Latricia was faking her injuries and that she should kick and stomp her whatever she's faking it. At approximately 8 p.m., Baltimore City Police responded to the 4400 block of Fairview Avenue for a report of an assault. When officers arrived, they located Latricia lying on the ground, suffering from cut wounds. She was rushed to the hospital for treatment, but sadly, she did not survive her injuries. Latricia passed away from a six inch deep wound to a major artery in her abdomen. During the investigation, Detectives talked to witnesses, surveyed the scene, and collected forensic evidence. Investigators spoke with Gabrielle and she told them where they could find the weapon. After obtaining a search warrant, the knife used in Latricia's land was found inside a closet in Moe's apartment. The pocket knife had been placed in between some clothing along with another item. Forensics also recovered blood samples from the weapon and sent it off for DNA testing. They also swabbed Latricia's fingernails. The DNA sample under her nails came back belonging to herself and Gabrielle, and Latricia's DNA was found on the knife. Gabrielle Smith was subsequently charged with slaying her former friend, along with several other charges. She was held in jail without bail. Gabrielle's first trial took place on February 3, 2015, but it ended in a mistrial. Her second trial started on October 26, 2015. The state called several witnesses to the stand, including a neighbor and investigators. Gabrielle claimed self-defense. According to her, when Latricia picked up the bear bottle, she feared for her safety, which resulted in her wounding Latricia. According to the state, Latricia retreated and no longer wanted any part of a physical altercation and tossed the bottle aside, breaking it on a wall outside. At that time, they believed Gabrielle had ample time to retreat back into Moe's apartment and could have avoided any further contact before Latricia was slain. After a three-day trial, a jury found Gabrielle Smith guilty of second-degree hit and a weapons charge. She received a total sentence of 33 years in prison. Gabrielle appealed her conviction in 2017, but she lost and her conviction remains. May Latricia Gowdy Sowers L. continue to rest in peace. My belated condolences to her family. This tragically senseless incident happened over a decade ago. Hopefully, they have received some closure. 
I wish them all well, especially her son, who had to grow up without his mother. Fam, this is a very sad ending to betrayal. There was a lot of hurt, emotions, and anger within this story. It's so sad that Latricia had to lose her life under those circumstances. She was just a month shy of completing cosmetology school. I wonder how long Latricia and Gabrielle were friends and when did she start seeing Latricia's husband? And don't get me wrong, Latricia's husband was wrong for crossing that line with Gabrielle too. But I don't think he or anyone could have seen it ending like this. Gabrielle was definitely gloating over the fact that she was with her friend's estranged husband, then ends up taking her life. I wonder if Gabrielle could go back to that day in October 2013, would she take everything back? It's just a messed up situation all around the board. Fam, let's keep the discussion going and share your thoughts with me on this story in the comments. All right, fam, that's it for this episode of The Baltimore Way. Thank you all so much for watching and making it to the end. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm out. What's going on, YouTube, fam? It's your boy Tony two times, and we back with another episode of the Baltimore Way, man. Before I start, be sure to tap that like button. Definitely watch this video to the end to hear the full story and all the details for the day one fam. Y'all already know it's all love. Thanks for tuning back into another episode. If you're new to the channel and you're feeling the content, feel free to subscribe. Definitely hit that notification bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new video. Oh yeah. Feel free to share the channel with your peoples. Everybody is welcome. Let's get right into the story. If you have lived long enough, then we all know life can get hard sometimes. Whether people deal with financial issues, struggling to survive, the pain of losing someone they were close to, or the stress and pressure of everyday living and maintaining our head. We have all had our moments where we felt like the weight of the world was on our shoulders. You could have been going through something with nobody to call and talk to, not knowing how to get out of the situation. And that's when some people start to feel like it's me against the world and all I got is myself. While some individuals are strong enough and emotionally stable to deal with their problems head on with logical thinking and figuring out a solution, others struggle in that area. Their issues and problems become mountains that they just can't seem to get around. They develop a sense of feeling defeated and feel like the world and everyone else is smiling, moving around, living life just fine, but they are stuck. That can mess with a person's mental. Even though as a grown man or woman, we should all know we can't blame other people for our problems, position in life, or how you feel about yourself. Some individuals choose to wake up mad at the world, feeling like society has let them down. And that misplaced anger can be a recipe for disaster. And on this episode of The Baltimore Way, We'll be discussing the case of a quiet loner who took out her frustrations about life on co-workers. Back in 2018, 26-year-old Snowshare Mosley was navigating life in Baltimore. The young lady had a pretty normal upbringing with her mother and siblings. She graduated from Overly High School in Baltimore County, and after that, she tried to attend Baltimore Community College for a few before realizing she needed money and school wasn't it for her. So the young lady decided it was time to go to work. Snowshare, who friends and family referred to as Snow, had been dealing with a particular situation since a teenager. See, the young woman, even though sweet and kind, didn't feel much like she was feminine and really felt she wanted to live her life as a man. It was something the young lady struggled with to come out to family and friends. But back in 2016, when she did, she was shocked for the response her people gave her. They told her they already knew and they still loved her for who she was. With that, Snow started identifying as a trans man. Fast forward back to 2018, Snow could finally be herself. She even got in a committed relationship with a 34-year-old woman named Sharon Foster. The two seemed happy, 
They grabbed the apartment in Baltimore County, and Snow always was on the hunt for new opportunities or a good job. But it seemed to be something deeper going on with her. At the time to the outside world, she was sweet, laid back, quiet, and a cool person. But her girlfriend soon realized Snow had mental issues. She would often zap out, have mood swings, and go into manic episodes and talk about hurting herself. She soon went to talk to a doctor, where in fact, they determined she had problems with her mental. But Snow brushed the situation off. She didn't receive her medication and kept living life. She would often vent to friends from high school, including one person in particular. She told them everything about her life. She wrote poetry. She would read this person her poems to the point they wanted to help Snow turn her writings into a documentary about her struggles with identity and being herself. They felt they could help someone else out there suffering from the same thing. But Snow was hesitant. She hated the limelight or being the center of any attention. As months went by, Snow described herself as feeling alienated, separated from the world. She felt she didn't fit in or belong, so her and her girlfriend just stayed to themselves. But Sharon still had to deal with Snow's mental breakdowns. Snow decided she would go out one day and purchase a handgun. With no criminal record, just minor traffic tickets, she bought a registered firearm and took it home. Sharon felt like Snow was changing and her intuition was confirmed. When one night, Snow upped the gun on her after getting frustrated over a simple argument. Snow quickly caught herself and apologized, but still had outbursts and violent thoughts. Testing Sharon one day, telling her I should go buy a machete and chop some people up. Brushing it off, Sharon just thought the young lady was venting and feeling frustrated about life. The two had financial issues as well. Struggling to make ends meet also was heavy on Snow's heart. But she would soon get a bright light of hope. When through a temp agency, she landed a what is considered a good job right outside of Baltimore County at the Rite Aid Distribution Center in Aberdeen, Maryland. With a job that paid decent, she now thought she could provide for her insurance. But money still was tight. Having an expensive apartment out White Marsh, Snow still felt frustrated. But she went to work every day smiling and chopping it up with her co-workers. Everyone liked the young lady. Despite her being a loner and quiet person, she never rubbed anybody the wrong way. On September 19th, 2018, Snow and Sharon got ready to go to bed. Before Snow stated, hold up. Let me pray my last time. Not thinking too much about it, Sharon was quiet while Snow prayed. Then they went to sleep. The next morning, Snow headed to work. When a little bit after 10 a.m., Sharon received a call from police telling her she can come retrieve her car from the warehouse. Confused, she asked what was going on and what was her girlfriend before then turning on the news. It had been a shooting at the job where six people had been shot. In a panic, Sharon went to the closet and saw Snow's gun was gone. At the Rite Aid warehouse, police was everywhere. The streets was blocked off and workers were being evacuated from the building and what was described as a mass shooting. Over three people were in stable condition, but three more unfortunately wouldn't survive their injuries. They were a 45-year-old Sandy Aguda, who was a Nigerian native living in Baltimore, working hard to send money back home to his kids. Sunday was married and was the sole provider for his wife and kids. The second victim was 41-year-old Bringer Gary, a mother of two that had just moved to Baltimore from Nepal to give her kids a better life. She had only been at the job three weeks and moved to Towson four months prior from Nepal. The last and youngest victim was 21-year-old Haleen Reyes. She too was from another place, the Dominican Republic. She was a mother of a two-year-old daughter and also moved to the States for a better life. It was only her second day at the job. As more information came out, police got word of a suspect, 26-year-old Snowshare Mosley, but she was MIA. Not long after, police found the young lady suffering from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. She was rushed to a local hospital, but she also would pass away from her injuries. As workers grieved, police looked for a motive. Some co-workers stated the usually quiet and cool Snow who got along with everybody, came to work that morning, angry, with a chip on her shoulder, and tried to start a fight with another worker. As the person brushed her off, while they were all outside the building, getting ready to walk in, she upped the gun and started shooting, with no target in mind, before chasing people in the building, letting off more shots. 
hitting six people in total. As news spread and loved ones came to check on their family who worked at the warehouse, people that knew Snow couldn't believe the situation, that a quiet, humble young woman had snapped like that. But no one was in more shock than Sharon. She felt she should have been up to stop Snow from grabbing a gun or took her outburst and the things she was saying more seriously. But she thought Snow was just talking out loud and venting. The families of the victims had to all live with the pain that their loved ones lost their lives for simply just waking up, going to work. As the story made national headlines, Snow's family and friends felt she was being painted as a monster. They all stated they didn't know what happened. They couldn't imagine her just waking up and deciding to shoot people. But unfortunately, it all was true and the damage was already done. In a sad ending, Sharon felt lost without Snow and partly responsible for people were gone. She couldn't afford the apartment and got evicted. Her friends noticed strange behavior, like her still texting Snow's phone, even though the young lady was gone. Then on October 31st, Halloween 2018, she herself also ended it all, leaving the count of lives lost at five. Till this day, it's still no steady motive on why Snow snapped, other than feeling isolated in society, dealing with identity issues and financial struggles. Pressure busts pipes, and life is only what you choose to make it and care about. That's why you will sometimes see a homeless person with a bigger smile on their face and on the street happier than a millionaire who has it all. It's a struggle every day for all of us, and it starts with the mind. If your mind isn't right, eventually you will break. Some say talk to a therapist. Others say just pray about it. But unfortunately for some people, they feel like the pain and struggle is so deep that the only way out is to leave. Rest in peace to the three victims in this story and also to Snow and Sharon. I send my prayers and condolences to the families. But I want to know what y'all thoughts on the situation in the comments. Have you ever felt you just couldn't take it and felt like snapping, like life was too much? And if so, what stopped you from going over the deep end and zapping out and losing it like Snow? Let me know in the comments. Yeah, man, crazy story, definitely. Rest in peace all the victims in this situation. Like I said, I send my prayers to their families. But I ain't going to talk too much more about this one. Y'all leave it in the comments. I appreciate you if you made it to the end. This is another episode of The Baltimore Way. It's your boy Tony two times. Love, fam. I'm out.